I'm Tom Nielsen, I'm the board president of Sunblock Board of Education. Uh, those principles that we're talking about, they go with the statement in five minutes. I think that was me that was asking the statement in five minutes. Um, and let me just say, I am extremely proud of what they communicated to you all. Um, I knew your time was precious, so I know, and I know they're not that good at time management, so if I said five minutes, they would probably take of all the great things going on in the district. Uh, can we give another round of applause? Uh, in the interest of time, I think I'd like to structure the next few minutes uh, as follows. I want to kind of tell the story of the, of the financial state that our district is in and a little bit about the referendum that's going to be coming up in April. I also want to make sure that you have a chance to ask any questions that you'd like. But I'm going to ask you to hold those to the end because some of you are here just to get an update. That's all you want. And then you want to go home and watch Dancing with the Stars or whatever. Okay. But anyone that has questions, I will speak as late as you'd like. Um, and I'm also going to give you a couple of easy ways to ask questions, either anonymously or uh, formally uh, after you leave here as well. Okay. So I'm going to do the painful part of the meeting. You guys have enjoyed the part and the proud part. I'm going to give you a little dose of financial reality. I'm going to give you a lot of information. Okay, and it's going to feel like you're drinking from a fire hose. But I want to give you some reassurance that a lot of what I'm talking about is out on a referendum website right now. You can go out there when you get home and check out all sorts of facts and figures and commonly asked questions. We also have a Facebook site that's gaining in popularity called Citizens for Salmonock Schools. I would heavily urge each of you to get uh, to friend that or like that site because you'll be able to get constant updates and information as we get closer and closer to the referendum. If you feel overwhelmed with my presentation, a lot of it's there for you, uh, available to you. Um, here's the deal. Salmonock Schools, as well as many, many other school districts in Illinois, are seeing a steep in revenue. If you have to leave before I'm done, this is the Cliff Notes version. Okay? Strong schools equal strong community. This impacts everybody in here, it impacts everybody in Salmonah. Whether you're a parent or a grandparent that has kids that you want to have a good educational experience for, this is going to impact you. Whether you're a landowner and you want to sell your house or your farm at some point in the future for a good price, what I'm going to talk about is going to impact you. Whether you're a businessman in Sabinac and you want to have customers coming into your business, this is going to impact you. Whether you're just a resident, you don't have kids, you're a senior, moved in here late in life, whatever the case, the school situation is going to impact you. Because I think you'll all agree in Samanoc, the school system is really kind of the hub of the community and is a place where people gather. Imagine Memorial Day barbecue and the veteran celebration without the school groups and school functions. I don't think it would be the same. The situation we face is that the revenues have dropped dramatically decreased, primarily because recession, which has driven down all of our property values, which means most of us have paid a lot less in property taxes the last two or three years than we did previously. That means the school's revenues and funding have gone down. Okay. The board has been managing this situation since 2009. I'll tell you some things that we've done to try to keep expenses in line with the drastically declining revenues. Um, and so we've tried to keep up, but we now know what the next two are most likely going to look like in terms of funding, and so additional cuts are going to have to be made if we aren't able to correct the revenue situation that faces our school district. So that's the Cliff Notes version for those of you that had those back when you went to school. Um, so here's a, a graphical picture of where we are in terms of revenue. So it goes up to about $10 million, which is what we were pulling in uh, a few short years ago year what's happening. Right now we're in this column right here, 2012-13. So notice the drastic drop. 
we know already that our revenue next year is going to be almost precisely uh, at this point. So notice the dramatic drop. We know that because the county assessors have told us what the property assessments are going to look like next year. We estimated two years after that, based on uh, a couple of financial firms that do this, we work with over 100 school districts in Illinois, as well as talking to the county assessors. So we've got a, a reasonably comfortable feeling that we know where revenue is headed in the next uh, few years. That's what it looks like. What have we done to try to keep up? We've tried to manage our expenses, trim where we could. We've made some painful cuts and some cosmetic cuts and some cuts that we're just deferring to later. And I'll share some of the details on that. This chart shows you, again, the revenue is the dark bar and our expenses is the light bar. Okay? So you can see that the revenue is the same as the last graph. It's going down every year. And you can see that we recognize the problem right in here started trimming expenses like crazy in 2010 and 11. And you can see that we're doing pretty good at keeping up with the decline in revenue. But we've got to do that again coming here next year. Okay, um, so we have been, well this one's hard to read from a distance. But when we make the cuts that we've made over the last three or four years, we kind of put them in three buckets top part of this triangle, which is what we try to minimize as much as possible, are the ones that have a direct, true, painful impact on kids. That's where we have to cut programs or eliminate opportunities that the kids have. The second category of cuts was where we were directly impacting the teaching staff. So we might have had to cut a teacher and see class sizes rise. We might have had to cut aids so there wasn't quite as much help for the teachers in the classroom. Uh, those types of things. And then the bottom part of the triangle was by design, we tried to make the largest area of cuts is in operations and administration. So what could we do to renegotiate contracts that we had with grass cutting firms and snow plowing firms? What could we do to streamline the operations and the administration? So we eliminated some administration positions, short people's hours, things like that. Over on the side of the slide here, I give you a rough idea of how much was cut from each of those categories. Okay. And I've got the next three slides break out itemized cuts in each of those categories. I'm not going to go through them all, but I want to just hit a couple of highlights. So at the top part of the triangle, where we cut programs which had a direct impact on kids, we did eliminate some programs. The family and consumer sciences, or what some of us old timers call home ec. Pre K, this was painful because educational studies will show that if you can get a kid started early in life in good education, uh, that helps them for their entire school career. We had to eliminate the pre K program, pre kindergarten program, because all of the funding uh, went away. We reduced music, we reduced the number of people that could go to the IVIC vocational programs and some other changes as well. These were very, very painful because we knew without a doubt they impacted a kid for the rest of his life. In the second part of the triangle, the teaching staff area, some of the changes that we made, we hopefully read that the teachers have agreed to a salary freeze three out of the last four years. What you probably don't know is they actually sacrificed increases that they were already owed contractually staff here in Salmon agreed to open the contract that they had. This was uh, three years ago now. They could have said, nope, you signed a contract, you owe us the raises for the next three years. They could have said that, and legally we would have had to pay them. They agreed to open the contract and sacrifice increases that were contractually owed to them. Now, in fairness, that contract was a four-year contract that was signed before the recession. Okay? So, um, they recognized things had changed, and God bless them, uh, they agreed to make some sacrifice there. At the same time, we, had, we got agreement to reduce the, the quality of the health insurance coverage and increase the deductibles by quite a bit. Don't quote me on this, but I think their deductibles went from $250 to $2,500. So, you know, that 
is in effect uh, a pay cut that the teachers agreed to. A number of other changes, including reducing a number of different roles. All of these were done. Do they have long-term consequences? <laughs> Probably. I'll give you one example. Reduction of one point of a social worker. Yes, we still have a social worker. So did we need two? One could argue that we didn't. I'll guarantee you the first catastrophic problem we have here, such as the one in Connecticut where there's some mental illness tied to it, people are going to say we need more attention, uh, we need more people helping our mental health and our people are struggling socially. But these are cuts we had to make, okay? and we hope that there's not disastrous long-term On the bottom side, the Operations Administration reduced a number of positions some that we would really like. You know, all this curriculum changes and core standards. We were on a real roll to make curriculum improvements, align them with the standards, align through the entire curriculum, developing our teachers in ways that no other districts were. We had to cut back. So we eliminated the director of curriculum position. We eliminated uh, Justin's old position as the athletic director and dean. Um, and have that staffed by teachers now. The administration and the non-teaching staff also agreed to pay freezes, uh, just like the teaching staff did. Reduced a number of secretarial type workers. Reduced custodians to part-time so that they don't get as many benefits. A lot of painful stuff, okay? And so you can go through the list on your own, uh, but suffice it to say, made a lot of cuts in all the different areas. Nothing that we're happy about, but something that had to be done. Where we could, we increased fees, okay? It's, you can see the dollar figure there, 58K. We can't increase fees enough to really make a dent without really, really, really uh, putting, it, putting it on the, the students uh, and, the, and their parents. So we've increased it a little bit where we can, uh, but you can see that that's not nearly the $2 million answer we're looking for in terms of how much revenues have decreased. The other thing is as we increase fees, more and more people become eligible for free and reduced fees because our costs go up and they can apply for exemptions as our fees get higher and higher. Okay, catch 22. In spite of all that, or maybe a little bit because of all that, um, Samanoff spends less per student than most school districts in the area. This graph shows our total operating dollars per student. Okay, and we are in the blue bar here. You can see it costs roughly $10,000 per student to educate them for the year. Sandwich is a little bit lower. Hinkley is a lot bit higher. Earlville is pretty close to us, and Leland is significantly higher. You can see the state average. Okay, so if you think that we're wasting money, I would challenge you, you can challenge me, but we're doing better than most in terms of how we uh, budget the money. Our teachers, whether you like the way teachers get paid or not, whether you like their pension systems or not, it is what it is. Our teachers are paid comparably to the other areas, and as Dr. Green mentioned, those that work in Oregon or Naperville or Aurora or that live in those areas could make a lot more money if they should so choose. In our area, we're fairly comparable. Um, and as I mentioned, three out of four years with no salary increase, sacrifice salary increases that were due them in their contract, and agreed to health insurance reductions. Our administrators, not proud of this, but it's reality are the lowest paid in the area, okay? We're the low bar here, Samanak. That's the average salary for an administrator. And you can see that everybody, including the state average, is higher. While I'm on this slide, while I don't like to say this, I'm going to try to squash a rumor that won't die. We do not pay our administrators to drive anywhere other than if they're going to a school function. Okay? We do not reimburse gas Dr. Green to drive home. She lives in Samrock. She goes home with her husband on the weekends. We do not pay any of those expenses. Please help me with that work. Anything else?
in spite of all of this, our students are performing well. We are, who are, this is the percentage of our students that take the standardized tests in all the grades that meet or exceed state standards. Okay? Meet or exceed state standards with 85. By two, we're going to the rest. So hats off to the students and the staff for what they are able to accomplish, even in these tough times. I read on Facebook to, yesterday a friend who was commenting to another friend, saying, I remember when we used to, Salmonock used to score better than Yorkville. I thought that was so awesome. Guess what? We still do. Have in the last three years. We've been at 85, Yorkville's been at 81. So it's still awesome. We're performing better than Yorkville. That's something that makes you happy. So now, we let, now let's shift gears. Let's talk about the referendum a little bit. We are going to go for the referendum April 9th. I want each and every one of you to vote. You know how I want you to vote. <laughs> but most importantly, I want you to vote. And I want you to vote based on fact. And we'll kind of wrap it up uh, towards the end with how I'd like to get back to you. Uh, how is the referendum going to impact your taxes? Well, the best way I can think of to show this is to actually pick some real houses. These are real people. This one's me, okay? That's my tax bill right there. Um, but I've got a $131,000 house, $221,000 house, $325,000 house. This shows how much taxes each person has paid since 2010 to support the schools. Okay? We're at 2012 right now. We already know, if you're in DeKalb County, we know that you're going to pay this much next year. Why? Because the county assessor has already sent you a letter that tells what your property assessments are going down. Most of the average homeowners are in the 11 to 11.5% 11 decline range. If you're in LaSalle County, such as me, we don't get individual letters, but I'll tell you that the county assessor has told us that on average, the county is going down 9%. Residential goes down more than farms, so if you're a homeowner in LaSalle, you can probably figure your assessed values are going to go down 11% as well. So, taking a look at this homeowner, he or she has been paying less the last few years. We already know what they're going to pay next year. If the referendum passes, that's this line. We already know they're paying a lot less next year. Congratulations. Save some of that money or enjoy it some way. You're not paying it to the school. In 2014, you'll be roughly back to where you were. Give or take a couple of bucks, depending on the value of your house. Okay? So, that's what your pet tax bill is going to look like, or has looked like, and will look like for the next few years. You might say, geez, Tom, doesn't the school have a savings account? <coughs> Can't we just weather the storm? Yes, we do have a savings account. It's almost two and a half million dollars. Sounds like a lot of money. It's less than four months worth of savings account. Any of you that listen to any financial experts have probably been told keep at least three to six months in the savings account in case you lose your job or you have a heart uh, bad illness or something like that. So yes, we do have a savings account to the tune of about two two point five million dollars. By the way, the only reason we have that savings account back in 2010, the board saw the trajectory of the revenue and the trajectory of the uh, savings account. We restructured the existing bonds. It's kind of like the financing your home. Um, we restructured the bond payment structure and we're able to bring in some equity. So we've got this working cash fund that's about $2.2 .2 million for the savings Why do we need that? Well, towards the end of every year, our fiscal year ends in June. The state doesn't pay us our last money until June. So if we didn't have a savings account, in May and June, we would not be able to write any checks or meet any payroll. 
Last year, we actually had to borrow 1.9 of the $2.2 million in May and June just to be able to, be, to pay the checks. Okay? So we don't want to dip too much into this savings account for very long, or we'll be in trouble in May and June. Um, however, having said that, the board has decided, as you'll see in a second, that if the referendum passes, in other words, if the community steps up and says, we want to support the schools, we will dip into the savings account, we will deficit spend for a year, I'll show you how that would work, um, rather than make cuts. Because even if the referendum passes, the school will not get any more money next year. We already know we're going to make $511,000 less next year than we did this year. So that means either we cut $511,000 worth of stuff next year, or we dip into the savings account. And the board has decided that if the referendum passes, we want to dip into the savings account. The board has also close to decided that if the referendum doesn't pass, the community has spoken twice. We think the first time they spoke in November, it was because a lot of people didn't understand. They simply went to vote for their favorite presidential candidate, or their least favorite not presidential candidate. So we're giving them another chance. We're, we're stepping up trying to educate people this time around. But if they vote, go again then the board is going to take that as a signal. We have to rein things in even further. We have to make cuts. And I'll show you what's being considered here in a second. Number one question, what are you going to do with the money? What are you going to do with the money if the referendum passes? Let me start with a statement in red, because it's absolutely true. The primary use of any extra money that's made from a referendum is going to be used to avoid cuts. I'll explain how that works in a second. I'll jump to the bottom of the slide, which I apologize some of you in the back can't read. But I think when some of you ask, what is money going to be used for, you're kind of asking, what, what aren't you going to use it for? Or I'll tell you what I don't want you to use it for, Tom. So let me tell you, teachers have a contract right now. It's a two-year contract. It does not. It runs through next year. Okay. There's a rumor going around that the teachers and the board have an under-the-table agreement that the day after the referendum passes, they're all going to get huge raises. Guess what? That's not true. There's no such agreement. There's no such plan. They have a two-year contract. They agreed to two years, no salary increases. Uh, for those two years. So I can tell you that referendum money is not going to go to raises. Okay? Um, now let me go back to the detail. Even if the referendum passes, this school district will not receive a dime until two years from now. We already know we're projecting a $511,000 decline in revenues. We have decided that if it passes, we will use the savings account or the reserves to avoid the cuts in the 2013-14 school year. If the referendum passes, two years from now, we'll make roughly $875,000 as a result of that pass. What will we do with that $875,000 two years from now? First thing is, we want to replenish the savings account. Remember, it's less than four months, and we're dipping, we're taking a quarter of it away. So we're going to, we want financial stability. We don't want to be on a roller coaster. We're going to replace, replenish the savings account. We also know that if property values go down, what the experts are telling us, we'd be faced with another $200,000 reduction in revenues the following year. So basically, the first $711,000 is going to be used to avoid making cuts. Then there's a little bit left over. And here's what we would most likely do with that, with that 164000 And it would probably be in this order. 
Well, we haven't had to make that decision yet, so I can't speak for the board. Um, but cover any pension burden shifts resulting from the state. If the state ever gets their act together and decides if and how much pension burden they're going to shift to the local school districts, it's going to hit us. It's going to hit us anywhere from zero to three hundred thousand dollars per year. We hope they don't do it all at once. They kind of hint that they won't. But we're going to have that legally. We have to do that. We have to pay that. So that would take, let's say, zero to hundred k. If we have something left, okay. Um, and property values decrease even more than we're afraid they are. We cover that. If property values don't decrease anymore, and we've actually got money left, we've talked about hiring targeted aides or teachers just to make sure that you know the class sizes haven't gotten out of range, that we've given as much student interaction time as we can. So that's what we do. And by golly, if we had any money left after those three things, Highly unlikely. We would build up the reserve funds even a little bit more just to make sure that we don't have to have conversations like this every year. How come other school districts aren't in such problems? Well, if they're in LaSalle County, they are. Earlville already went for a referendum. You probably realize they failed the first time, passed the second time. Leland is going for a referendum in April. Streeter's talking about it. Or Serena's talking about, or Street, Serena is planning to do it, not in April, but next time around, and Streeter's also talking about it. Now, why did I say schools in LaSalle County? Schools in LaSalle County play by a different set of rules than most schools in Illinois. Dumb luck. Bad luck for us. Okay? We are what we, they call it, or the other counties are what they call a tax cap county. What that means is, back when values were going up, they were capped. They could only raise their tax bills so much. So property owners didn't see skyrocketing tax bills. But when values are going down, which is now, they are guaranteed the same or more money than they had last year, this year. How do they do that? They just jack up your tax rate without even having to ask. Okay? So we are in LaSalle County. In LaSalle County, if we want to change your tax rate, we got to ask you on the other fund. Um, so as property values go down and your tax bill goes down, so go our revenues. What would it take to change that? The majority of voters in LaSalle County would have to want to change that. I guarantee you that's not going to happen. I don't think it's even being discussed. The LaSalle County sales tax issue got voted down. What floors me is it got voted down in Sama. Let me just take a second on LaSalle County sales tax because I believe it's going to be on the referendum in April again. Unless you do all of your shopping in Ottawa or LaSalle, Peru, you should vote yes for the LaSalle County sales tax. The school district, if that passes, will get between $300,000 and $350,000 per year that we can use on capital improvements or pay down building loans and so on. Um, and it won't cost you a dime unless you do your shopping in Ottawa or LaSalle, Peru. There's very few businesses in Salmonac that charge sales tax. Okay? Tractors are exempt, as I understand. Things like that are exempt. So, uh, well, guess I'll have them. Like the schools. I want to show you the effect down here. If you, if you can see, these three houses, Salmonac, Sandwich, and Yorkville, are all Salmonac staff members. I got their tax bills. They're all roughly the same. Salmonox houses were 221, sandwiches were 230, Yorkville's were 210. Here's what's happened to their property values in the last three years. Salmonox and Sandwich have gone down about 14%. Yorkville's property values have gone down 23%. But because we're in LaSalle County, our property owner in Salmonox has seen their tax bill go down $279 per year, whereas the Yorkville resident has only seen his go down $125. The reason he's seen his go down at all is because there's been growth in Yorkville. If there had not been any growth in Yorkville, even though his values went down 23%, his tax bill would have gone up. Okay? And in Yorkville, he's paying $500 more than the Salmonock taxpayer. 
What did I say earlier about student achievement in Yorkville and Selmock? I think I said Selmock was beating Yorkville, didn't I? Did I? I can't remember. You probably still have questions. And I'll be here as late as you want to stay. But there's a lot of common questions out on the referendum website. There's a place on that website where you can submit questions. There's also a Facebook site where you can submit questions. And Jay, would you just stand up? Jay Wakeman is the referendum committee chairperson. If you'd like to bombard his email, go for it. You might not realize the school cannot expend resources on encouraging you to vote a certain direction. So you notice I've never told you how to vote yet, have I? Um, even though I'm not paid, I could probably do that. Dr. Green cannot tell you how to vote because she's being paid for with taxpayer dollars. So we had to get a, a committee of volunteers, and Mr. Wegman was kind enough to step forward and do that and sacrifice a lot of hours of energy to do it. So thank you, Jay, for everything you've done in our doing. But he will take email questions as well. Okay, before I go to probably the money slide, the one that you all want to see. Let me just stop and say, the next slide is ugly. It's painful. It's depressing. There's not a single member of the board that likes it. Most of them have accepted that we are where we are. Okay? And so the next slide is going to paint the picture of what will happen if the referendum passes, and what will happen if the referendum fails. We heard last time when we did our post-mortem debrief that people really wanted to know what cuts are going to be made, what is the money going to be used for, that type of thing. We tried to lay out two years for you. Okay? We tried to lay out a two-year timeline to show you what would happen. We tried to break that into two years. Obviously, with the second year, we'll adjust as we get there. But unfortunately, legally, we have to announce this year's staff cuts, if there are going to be any, before the referendum. It stinks, but we have to do it legally. So we have to make staffing decisions before we know the answer. That stinks. We've got people out right now from our staff looking for jobs. That bugs me. People that shouldn't be looking for jobs are looking for jobs because they don't know what's going to happen. I wish we could have passed in November so that people didn't have to go through this angst. And this is painful stuff. I don't like it. The board doesn't like it. The administration doesn't like it. But we want to lay it out as good as we can and know that we're going to do everything we can to make this district as good as it can be. Let me start over if the referendum passes. As I stated earlier, there's no impact on taxpayers' bills until two years from now. The board has decided we will dip into the savings account, do deficit spending, which will eliminate the need to implement any cuts next year. <coughs> For the average homeowner, if the referendum passes, your taxes paid two years from now will be very, very comparable to what they are, what you just paid this year. And next year, you get a break. You're going to save hundreds and hundreds of dollars depending on the value of your home. Okay? But two years from now, they would go up to roughly what you paid this year. I want to be honest and tell you that either way, whether it passes or fails, we are continuing to tighten the belt, and so there are a few things we're going to do next year. First is, we've looked at the PE class sizes at the high school. We think we have to, and we plan to, reduce a high school PE position. That will drive the PE class sizes up. We have decided to eliminate the outdoor education program. That's where people go over to uh, Hoover. We need to probably make better use of our own 
uh, natural landscape right back here. That was one of the thoughts when we bought the land. Uh, that and growing, which obviously is tame. Um, and we decided to increase the fee for IVIC students that go over to the vocational program by $100 to $100. It costs us $1,900 for each kid that goes over there. Okay, We're going to charge the students $100. We think that's fair because we charge band students $75. Okay? We should charge the IVIC students some money as well. So those changes are going to happen no matter what. This is the list that I warned you about, the painful list. If you can't read this, I'll read it, okay? And it is in, it's on the list. Do we know if it got on the school website yet, or is it going to be on here? Okay, we'll find out. The intent is this will be on both the school website and the reference website. Two years worth of cuts, okay? Um, I'm giving you a sneak preview. The board will make formal announcements of this batch at our February board meeting, okay, including the staff reduction, saying who's going to possibly not have a job. That will all be announced at our February board meeting. What types of things are being considered? Middle school sports being eliminated. We thought there's, there's alternative programs with winter basketball, AYSO, Salmonox on the rack. Okay. Eliminate high school golf and track. The thought there is the numbers are fairly low. And the impact on the community is not as high as some of the other sports. Eliminate high school freshman sports and JV sports. Okay, still having sports, but not nearly as many expenses or programs. With that, reducing an athletic coordinator position that's currently staffed by two teachers. Reducing Spanish offerings so that we only offer a two-year Spanish program instead of a four-year program. Limit the number of students for IVIC, vocational program. We, we're on the hook for thousands of dollars whether we send anybody to IVIC or not. So we're going to keep sending people to IVIC. But we might limit it to one bus full or a certain number since it costs us $1,900. Reduce the number of buses. We've got parents already that have kids on the bus for an hour and 10 minutes. Kindergartners on the bus for an hour and 10 minutes. Not good. Um, but we're talking about reducing bus counts, which will increase the bus for some kids. Uh, reduce the James R. Wood teacher. James R. Wood's great right now because we're going to look at what student counts are and put them where we need them the most. But it will most likely drive some class sizes up, probably in the 32 ish range. The fourth graders are already at 30, 31. Reduce high school English choices by not retiring, but by not replacing a retired English teacher, which will reduce the choices. <clears throat> and reduce, almost eliminate drivers that behind the wheel. We're legally required to offer drivers that, and we're legally required to offer at least a couple of kids behind the wheel. So we will do that. Um, but the rest of the kids could have to go to uh, a program, Northville or something like that, but where there's some okay. These are all cuts that we made the first year. I don't like any of them, but the part that really scares me is the bottom part of this list. To me, this is catastrophic. We cannot let this happen. Okay? But these are the types of things that we're looking at. Funding would not be available for sports, for ag, for new vocal music, for art, for band. We change kindergarten back to a half day. Uh, which we don't want to do. We'd eliminate a high school math teacher and increase class sizes. We'd eliminate, as a fallout of that, middle school computer program. You do all that, you don't have much to offer the kids, so you shorten the day because there's no electives to take. And anything else that's required, we're still looking at that. There have been some very, very painful discussions <coughs> in the boardroom. As you can imagine, probably in your dining room tonight, none of us want to see this. None of us want to see this. And none of this will happen if the referendum passes. Okay? But this is roughly <coughs> the timeline and the game plan that we think will happen if it fails. And that's because
is the committee will have said twice, we don't want to support the schools. We want to keep all of our savings in our own pockets. And then we've got to take action. Okay? Now, if you're as uncomfortable with that thought as I am, what can you do between now and April? First of all, thanks for coming. Stay informed. Stay informed. Plenty of ways to do that. Facebook is an awesome tool. Website. We've got a referendum website. Come to the board meetings. Talk to friends and neighbors. If you're going to vote no, don't talk to your friends and neighbors. <laughs> and just go sit quietly and vote no. Okay? But if you're going to vote yes, talk to anybody that you can. Correct wrong information. If someone's telling you something that sounds totally ridiculous, like, I know the board says it's only going to cost X dollars, 86 is what it was going to cost in the last referendum. I know the board says it's telling you it's going to cost 86 dollars in increased taxes. But I've calculated it myself, and it's actually going to cost 900 dollars. If you hear something like that, that just does not make sense, ask me, ask Dr. Green. We can probably spend more time figuring it out than this um, Visit the referendum website if you'd like to volunteer for Corral, Jay Wakeman, here or me this evening. You can volunteer for a whole bunch of different things on that website. If you'd like to make a small donation even before your tax bill, uh, we have printing costs, we have mailing costs. Our goal, we've got 25 volunteers right now actively calling people in DeKalb County we're going to switch to LaSalle next. Our goal is to make sure that every single voter hopefully gets a phone call, at least one flyer, and at least a knock on the door before April. Okay? Will it happen? Probably not, because people don't answer the phone and aren't home. But that's the goal. Every single voter gets at least three contacts. So if you can help, we'd love to have you do it. Vote. I can't tell you how to vote, but please, vote. Okay? Please. Um, let me wrap it up with this. I apologize I'm late. Uh, but first of all, thanks for coming and listening to the great accomplishments of all the schools. I am immensely proud of what they're doing. We've given them some tough environment to do it in. Okay. Uh, and we're doing a fantastic job. The reason that you're here, hopefully, is to make sure that you've got correct information. Spread that word. Make sure that people all understand not have to like the situation. We don't have to feel good about the situation. You might even feel mad about the fact that we're here. You might be mad about something that you think got us here. If you want to be mad about something, go ahead. I hope you're not. But what we pay our teachers did not get us here. A previous administrator did not get us here million dollar decline in revenue got us here. Now we've got to get together and deal with that. So don't base your vote on bad information. Don't base your vote on a grudge. Because the only thing you're going to do if you vote no based on bad information or grudge is hurt your kids, hurt your Property values and build the future of Summerlock as a whole. So if you have a grudge, come yell at me. You've got big shoulders, but vote for the future. And I'll leave that to you on what you like to vote. Dr. Green has passed out a blue survey form. We really, 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 really would appreciate it if you would take just a couple minutes to fill that out. The first section is just how do you feel about the school and what can we do to improve. And the last section is any questions or comments you have on the financial situation. We're going to take that information. We're going to run with it. Remember, there's lots of ways to ask questions. And the first one will start as soon as I stop talking and the first person raises their hand. But in politeness and fairness to everybody, if you've heard what you wanted to hear, 
this is the conclusion of the program. If you leave, you get off road, and you walk out, and you want to stay and hear what other questions people are asking, that's fine too. We'll do our best to answer them and, as appropriate, post them on the website if we think they're of common interest. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your support of some of our schools. And if you have any questions for now in April, make sure to ask somebody at this point in time looking at our reality of the situation.